coming up on The World Today. U.S. seeks to assure France over UK-Australia security pact as Paris describes the move as a stab in the back. Millions of Russians begin voting in three-day parliamentary election as opposition smart app removed. Plus, Italy makes COVID-19 green pass compulsory for all workers. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenny Ola Shoboale. We begin with the reactions continuing to trail the announcement of the new security pact between the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia. The deal, seen as an effort to counter China, will see the US and UK give Australia the technology to build nuclear-powered submarines. But the move has angered France, which says it was stabbed in the back. While China has accused the three powers of having a Cold War mentality, the alliance known as AUKUS was announced by U.S. President Joe Biden, U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his Australian counterpart Scott Morrison on Wednesday. Well, still on the security alliance between the United States, Australia and Britain, speaking at a joint news conference after meetings between the U.S. and the Australian Foreign and Defence Ministers in Washington, Australian Defence Minister Peter Dutton explains that the pact will see greater air cooperation through rotational deployments of all types of U.S. military aircraft to Australia, or well, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken also said the partnership is to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. Australia and the United Kingdom is a signal that we're committed to working with our allies and partners, including in Europe, to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. We welcome European countries playing an important role in the Indo-Pacific. Indo we look forward to continue close cooperation with NATO, with the European Union, and others in this endeavor. France, in particular, is a vital partner on this and so many other issues, stretching back generations, and we want to find every opportunity to deepen our transatlantic cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. I'm proud to announce that Australia and the United States will be significantly enhancing our force posture cooperation increasing interoperability and deepening alliance activities in the Indo-Pacific. This will include greater air cooperation through rotational deployments of all types of US military aircraft to Australia. And we'll have more on the uh, situation. In the meantime, US President Joe Biden has held a virtual meeting of the major economies forum urging world leaders to join the U.S. and the EU in a pledge to cut methane emissions to build yeah, momentum ahead of an international summit on climate change later this year. The summit is a follow-up to an Earth Day meeting he hosted in April to unveil new U.S. greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets and press other countries to do more to curb theirs. Leaders from Argentina, Bangladesh, Indonesia, South Korea, Mexico, Britain and the EU took part along with United Nations Secretary-General Antonio Guterres. To bring the Glasgow, we have to bring to Glasgow our highest possible ambitions. Uh, those that have not yet done so, time is running out. For our part in America, I'm working to pass historic investment and in, to modernize our climate resilient infrastructure to build a clean energy future that creates millions of jobs and ushers in new industries of the future. As part of this work, the United States is committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions between 50 and 52 percent below 2005 levels by the year 2030. And, uh, you know, we, we set a goal that by 2025, our power sector will be with, free of carbon. In 2030, 50 percent of the cars sold in the United States, we believe, should be and must be electric vehicles. A further step we're working with the European Union and other partners to launch is a global methane pledge to reduce global methane emissions by at least 30 percent below 2020 levels by 2030. This will not only rapidly reduce the rate of global warming, but it will also produce uh, a very valuable side benefit like improving public health and agricultural output. 
Let's head back to the security pact now between the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia. To take a closer look at this pact, we're being joined by Edward Opa, a geopolitical analyst. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Well, thank you for having me. So while it's understandable China's position in all this, France has called this a stab in the back by America. Why is Paris so against this? Well, again, you know, who, who, who remembers France, you know, apart from, you know, their wine and their cheese. So I think France is feeling alienated because, you know, they, 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 they think they're one of the seven superpowers in the world. So they think everything America, UK does, they have to be included. Obviously, they were not included. So that is why they are angry and they're reacting the way they are. You know, China says this uh, security pact signifies a continuation of the Cold War mentality uh, by the United States. Do you agree? No, I don't. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, China. You know, in, in all fairness, I mean, you know, I applaud them for what they have done. But China has become a nuisance in the world. You know, they force their way into countries. They try to do deals. You know, under the table. They will you know, the terms are not known. I mean, you could see that in, in most African countries, you know, are very angry at how China has, in, you know, come into the country. But in no fault of China, you know, China got in, invited. But China doesn't play fair. China don't play, you know, transparently. So I think the world is waking up to their, to, to their way of dealing and they want to curb that, you know, that, that excess you know, power they think they have. All right, then, uh, geopolitical analyst Edward Okwa, thank you so much for your thoughts uh, on the program. Well, thus, seeing we are trying to get VOA White House correspondents for more on this. We'd just like to remind you uh, that this deal is seen uh, as an effort to counter China. Uh, it will see the U.S. and U.K. give Australia the technology to build nuclear-powered submarines. But as we mentioned earlier, the move has angered France, which says it was stabbed in the back. While China has accused the three powers of having a Cold War mentality, the alliance known as AUKUS was announced by U.S. President Joe Biden, U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his Australian counterpart uh, Scott Morrison on Wednesday. Uh, we'll try and uh, connect with the VOA's White House correspondent. In the meantime, let's take a look at some uh, I hear that we have Anita with us. Uh, Anita, uh, finally good to get you on the show. Thank you so much. So how is the Biden administration reacting to all this, especially with France saying uh, that this is a stab in the back? Right. So we asked uh, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki about this yesterday, and she said, you know, France is still an excellent partner of the United States. We will continue to work together on a number of other issues. It's important to note that Secretary of State Antony Blinken earlier said that France was consulted on the AUKUS agreement that would, you know, in effect nullify this $43 billion submarine deal that they're so upset about. So the White House is maintaining that not only did the French know that this was going to happen, that their relationship is going to be just Fine going forward uh, in the wash, although she did acknowledge that uh, right now, I mean, it, it is a bit it, it's a bit tense with France saying what they're saying. But she said, we we hope we can keep working together as a trusted partner. OK, well, with tensions already high between the United States and China, what happens if Beijing decides to take this as America's declaration of Cold War? Are officials prepared for this possibility? Well, I just want to say that ch the Chinese foreign minister did say that the United States had a Cold War mentality with this AUKUS agreement. So it seems like China already believes that that might be the case. I asked uh, Jen Psaki about this yesterday and I said, you know, what what tools might you use now that China is, of course, uh, making moves like rejoining the, trans uh, the tripartite trade alliance, the TPP? And she said, we have a number of tools that we could use uh, to keep our relationship with Beijing going, including, you know, non-economic tools, non-trade tools. We can we're, we still talk about ch climate change. And um, she's described the U.S. relationship with with China as a difficult relationship and as one characterized by stiff competition. And so the way that they describe it, this is this is more of the same and the U.S. continues to engage with China, she said, and will continue to engage. All right, then, VOA White House correspondent, Anissa Powell, thank you so much for your thoughts on the program.
Thank you. Moving on now, some 10,000 migrants have gathered on the U.S.-Mexico border bridge over recent days, leading to a growing humanitarian crisis. The bridge connects Del Rio in Texas to Mexico's Zuidad Acuna and the temporary camp uh, there has grown with staggering speed in recent days. Uh, the mostly Haitian migrants who have crossed the Rio Grande are sleeping on the, the bridge. The U.S. government has been facing a surge of migrants at the border. Earlier this year, it was reported that the number of migrants detained at the U.S.-Mexico border in July exceeded 200,000 for the first time in 21 years. The UN Security Council has unanimously renewed a UN political mission in Afghanistan for six months following the Taliban takeover of the country in August. The 15-member council asked UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to report by January the 31st, 2022, on strategic and operational recommendations the for the mandate of, of the mission in, in light of recent political, security and social Meeting developments. I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in favour of the draft resolution contained in document S-2021-804 please raise their hand. The result of the voting is as follows. The draft resolution received 15 votes in favour. The draft resolution has been adopted unanimously as resolution 2596 2021. And over in Russia, millions have started voting in a parliamentary election that will last till Sunday. The election is a test of President Vladimir Putin's grip on power across 11 time zones from the Pacific Ocean to the Baltic Sea. At a time, uh, the Russian president voted via an online system as he's in self-isolation after dozens of people in his entourage fell ill with COVID-19. Allies of Alexei Navalny, President Putin's fiercest critic, plan to use a mobile app to organize a tactical voting campaign to deal a blow to the president's party. Well, Russia demanded this month that the Apple and, and Google remove the app from their stores, saying a refusal to do so would be treated as meddling in its parliamentary election. So to come on the program. Organizers of the Beijing Winter Olympics 2022 unveil official motto of Together for a Shared Future. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi has cautioned Britain that if the Northern Irish peace deal is destroyed, then there would be no post-Brexit trade deal with the United States. The U.S. has expressed grave concern that a dispute between London and Brussels over the implementation of the 2020 Brexit Treaty could undermine the Good Friday Accord, which effectively ended three decades of violence. It's not said as any threat. It's a prediction. If there's a, if there's destruction of the Good Friday Accords, be very unlikely to have a UK US bilateral. We have to have a path that includes that. Now, our distinguished ambassador has made uh, the UK position very clear to us about the complexity of the negotiation. So let's just, and by the way, I have to say that the leadership in Ireland is very sympathetic to, let's work this out. Nobody's declaring one thing or another, but you asked, yeah, it would be problematic in terms of a, a bilateral. 
Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has met his new cabinet in Downing Street, the first meeting since his reshuffling of senior ministers earlier in the week. In the reshuffle on Wednesday, Prime Minister Johnson appointed his party's first female foreign secretary as he urged his government to get on with the job of tackling economic inequality after COVID-19. or the removal of uh, Don Rabb as UK foreign minister, uh, he was replaced by former trade minister at the Foreign Office at Liz Truss. Annie Marie Trevelyan moved to trade after being Climate Minister. <laughs> Michael Gove, seen as a key player in the Johnson government, was moved to housing from his position in the Cabinet Office. And our leaders of West Africa's regional bloc, ECOWAS, have imposed travel bans and a freeze on the financial assets of Guinea's coup leaders and their families. The sanctions are expected to put more pressure on the military leaders to restore constitutional rule. West African leaders gathered in Ghana's capital, Accra, on Thursday to decide how they can steer Guinea back towards constitutional rule after a coup ousted President Alpha Conde last week. The 15-nation economic community of West African states condemned the putsch and has suspended Guinea from the bloc's decision-making bodies. Ghana's president, Nana Kufo Addo, is the ECOWAS chairman and he says he's counting on the leaders to help offer durable solutions to the crises. We are required to take informed decisions on these matters that will have long-term consequences for the stability and the defense of the democratic values of our region. I count on you, Excellencies, to help proffer durable solutions to the crisis. And I'm confident that, as in the past, we will rise to the occasion. Original heads of states decided to freeze the financial assets and impose travel bans on Guinea's junta members and their relatives insisting on the release of President Alpha Conde on a short transition. Looking now at the political situation and the way forward, the head of state insisted that the transition must be very short. Must be very short. And they were even they even went to the way of clearly stating that the transition should not last more than six months. So six months, election should be held. This time, the authority decided to go on specific sanction directly to individual. So we are not going to have the general sanction where we impose a ban of uh, traveling, ban of trade, uh, financial... Uh, 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 sanction on all activities, financing activities uh, of, the, of banking uh, and financial sectors. So it's very targeted. The bloc also piled more pressure on Mali's transitional government, demanding they stick to an agreement to organize elections for February 2022 and present an electoral roadmap by next month, according to the post summit communique. And uh, in discussing the issue and the situation in Mali, the head of state uh, first were very preoccupied by the slow progress in the preparation of the election. They were, they were preoccupied and they did insist, they reaffirmed again, that the date set for the election in February 2022 is not negotiable. We're very clear and insisted on that. The date for the election in 2022 is not negotiable. The junta in Guinea, led by Mamadi Dumbuya, a former member of the French Foreign Legion, is holding consultations with various public figures, groups and business leaders and business leaders in the country to map a framework for a transitional government. As part of the four-day consultation, the junta is meeting with Guinea's main business lobby and executives of mining firms operating in its bauxite, gold, iron ore and diamond sector. The junta has not said how long the transitional government will last or who will lead it.
So updates from the COVID-19 pandemic now. Employees in Italy could face suspension without pay for failing to show a COVID-19 green pass. Here's more on this and other developments on our COVID-19 global update. Italy has become the first country in Europe to require all workers in both public and private sector to show proof of vaccination, a negative test or a recent recovery from COVID-19. The law which penalizes anyone who fails to present a valid health certificate or green pass will come into effect on October 15th. Workers will face fines of up to 1,500 euros for failure to produce the pass, while the employers can be fined up to 1,000 euros. Cambodia has started its vaccination exercise for children aged between 6 to 12 years old in a bid to reopen the country to foreign tourists and all the schools for its 1.8 million youth population. Prime Minister Hun Sen unveiled the campaign with his grandchildren and young family members of other senior officials being given their shots. Nearly 72% of Cambodia's almost 17 million people have received at least one COVID-19 shot since vaccinations began in February, mostly with China's Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines. Over in Australia, the country is looking to reopen its borders, which have been shut since March 2020. Prime Minister Scott Morrison says officials will trial a home quarantine system for international travellers arriving in Sydney. We are now finalising arrangements. That Meanwhile, New Zealand has extended its pause on the travel bubble with Australia for at least another eight weeks. The so-called Trans-Tasman bubble began in April and allowed Australians and New Zealanders to travel between the two countries without the need to quarantine. It was paused in July as Australia struggled to contain new outbreaks fueled by the highly contagious Delta variant. Ahead of the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, organizers have sent out warm invitations worldwide with the unveiling of Together for a Shared Future as the official motto. An expert panel selected the motto from 79 proposals submitted since May 2020 and finalized after repeated discussions. The Beijing 2022 organizers explained that Together depicts how mankind stays strong when facing adversities and points out the solution to overcome those difficulties and create a better future for a shared future embodies a vision for a better life and conveys hope and confidence. The Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics will run between February the 4th and February the 20th, with the Winter Paralympics following between March the 4th and March the 13th. Something to definitely look forward to. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Ola Shabuale. Have a lovely weekend.